just begin by saying that uh, I agree, context is everything. But may I also say that as someone who's been working in this field for quite a long time, one of the issues that we confront and that we rarely recognize is the role of history. We live in a world that is so driven by data that gives us such an enormous understanding about what's happening now that a lot of our attention is devoted to thinking about how the present is going to configure the future. Well, one of the things that will happen to all of you is that you will get old. <laughs> I'm told that I don't necessarily look it, but in January of next year, I'm going to be 70 years old. I have a slim trim voice speaker, and I'm told by my students that uh, I don't look a day over 66, but, <laughs> but for the conversations that we're having about health, inequity, and ways in which we are expected to be the ones who will drive the agenda of the future, let me say something about the past and how it affects the work that I've been doing as a researcher in HIV AIDS since 1986. This is a talk in which I want to connect a number of dots. They're disparate dots, but if I'm successful, you see how all of them work together to create a kind of a synergy that ends ultimately in not a set of abstractions, but in a set of categorical imperatives that each of you is in a position to influence. I don't want to talk just about abstracts. I want to talk about ways in which we act individually to move on some of the principles, some of the problems, some of the challenges that you've heard expressed over the course of this morning. So part of the nature of the dots is to sort of understand that for many of you who do work in this field, you recognize that we just basically went through a milestone. June 5th, 1981, for many of you, was the date when the MMWR, the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, published an article that described an odd and somewhat difficult to digest anomaly. A group of five men had walked into a clinic in Los Angeles <coughs> separately, they weren't together, each presenting with symptoms of an old person's cancer, and later on, an old person's pneumonia. <coughs> This is the beginning in the United States and in many instances in the rest of the world of our understanding that HIV AIDS was in our midst. But those of you who know something about the virus understand that what we were looking at in 1981 wasn't the beginning of the epidemic. No, we were looking at basically the end stage of HIV disease. And because HIV is a virus that lays latent in the blood for 10, perhaps 15 years, the real historical beginnings of the epidemic are not in 1981. They have to go back much further. All right, this is a principle of public health. I'm assuming that because I'm in a school of nursing that everybody has been exposed to the science of epidemiology. So if you will, let me cite one of the fundamental principles of epidemiology, which is that if you're going to have an epidemic that grows and becomes a pandemic, there has to be motion. Folk who are infected, if we're talking about an infectious disease epidemic, have to find folk who are not infected. And some sort of interaction has to occur so that new hosts are created. Fundamental principle of epidemiology, never and ever at any point do you want to let a reservoir of infection remain untreated, uncontained. Now, how does this relate to history? And in what way does this explain the current HIV pandemic in the United States? How does it help us under, under understand why and in what way this pandemic is one of the leading health disparities that we confront as a nation? Those of you who keep up with the numbers are aware of the fact that in 1986, for example, when I first started working with Mindy Thompson Fulop in this field, Roughly 27% of all the folk who were reported with a case of AIDS were African American. 12% of the population, but already 27% of the folk who were dealing with this virus. Fast forward to 2010. Almost 50% of the new cases of HIV in the United States are reported amongst African Americans. 
how do you explain that dramatic change in such a short space of time in the prevalence and incidence of a disease that was first isolated and identified in gay men? What changed? What are the historical factors that drove it? Well, part of what I think has to be taken into account is the fact that in the 1970s, we as a nation started to make a war on drugs. We decided, based on a speech that President Nixon gave in 1970, that drugs were public enemy number one, and that one of the most important priorities for our government was to do something about the scourge that was on the land. Well, the problem with deciding that you're going to make a war on drugs is that we took a public health medical crisis and converted it into a criminal justice issue. Are we aware of the fact that in the 1970s we had effective treatments for people who were living with addiction? We can't cure addiction, chronic relapsing illness, but we certainly know how to help people who are struggling with it to lead stable, reasonably normal lives. There are large numbers of folks, 25, 30 years living with their addictions who have led, for all intents and purposes, lives that are an absolute uh, tribute to mainstream America. So the notion that what we would do with this problem was not so much treated, but that we would incarcerate it has created a major problem. And its most important problem has been not simply that we took a lot of people who were infected with HIV back in the 1970s, when heroin addiction and cocaine addiction was rampant in many poor communities of color. It's not just that we took folk who were hosts for this virus and locked them up. It's that by taking them out of their communities, we destroyed the social fabric that made those communities work. I'm suggesting that the war on drugs is a major social driver of inequalities in the United States, not just in HIV. I understand that uh, we are, in the United States, 5% of the world's population. But as a nation, we incarcerate 25% of all the prisoners doing time in prisons in the world. 5% of the world's population detaining 25% of all the world's prison, prisoners in institutions here in the United States. And congratulations, it's Texas. You guys are doing quite a good job. <laughs> Not everybody is aware of the fact that this is an issue that has less to do with crime and more to deal with issues of race and ethnicity in the U.S. Maybe you're aware of the fact that two years ago, according to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, roughly one in every three black men in the United States will do time in a prison in his life. That roughly 40% of all the folk who are currently doing time in state or federal prison are African American. And if you add to that another 18% who are a Latino in their origin, all of a sudden you have a system of mass incarceration in this country that is less about crime and much more about social control. And it's much more about social control that is being imposed on poor communities of color. Where in the community where I work, Washington Heights in New York City, in 1990, on any given day of the week, Roughly 35 to 45 percent of all the young men in that community were either in jail or prison, on parole, or under the supervision of the courts. With so many of these folks doing time for victimless crimes, both who were committed to prison because of their drug use or because of their possession of drugs, the whole notion that we were somehow protecting society has to be re-examined especially when we look at the ways in which the epidemic of drug use in the United States also became an epidemic of HIV AIDS. So at some point in time, my lovely face is obscuring one of the numbers as supposed to proceed. <coughs> I don't have control of the video. Uh, by the way, should I apologize? I'm told 
that whenever I do PowerPoint, which I really detest, I really do it. It's only when there are CME conferences and they tell me you have to have something that can go in your phone or something. And you don't use it. I was trained as a preacher and if you detect a preaching style in my voice, yes, yeah, because I was always about giving talks as opposed to giving people slices from a textbook. Oh, one of the things that happens is, as a result, whenever I go to a conference where I'm using PowerPoint, invariably the technology crashes. I feel personally responsible for all the difficulties that all the speakers have had. And I just need to extend an apology to all of you. I promise the next time I come, I won't bring PowerPoint. And if you tell the organizers to insist that I not do it, I think everybody else's technology will work. <laughs> One in four persons in that last line, incarcerated as a result of drug use or a drug related offense. You understand that this is a public health problem that's being treated by our courts and our police? I'm just saying I have nothing against the courts and I have nothing against the police. My brother Harold just retired from 20 years on the bench as the presiding judge of the Superior Court in Essex County, New Jersey, where Newark, New Jersey is located. And in that 20 year career, 20 year career on the bench. He sent a lot of people to prison. I've been in his courts. I understand that there are some folks who really just basically don't need to be with us. But I want to separate the issue of who should or who should not go to jail or prison from the issue of whether or not an inequitable social set of policies, social policies, have created a health problem for all of us that we are challenged in very deep ways to correct. All right, having said that we locked up a whole bunch of folk who were probably infected with the virus, what's the ultimate result of that? Well, one of the things that becomes clear is that if we locked up a number of people who were at risk for the virus, we shouldn't be surprised at the fact that for much of the 1990s, rates of HIV infection in the nation's prisons, both state and federal prisons, were four to five times what they were in the general population. And you have to understand that many of the folks who went to prison didn't stay there. They cycled back and forth. As the statistic up there indicates, they have a problem with recidivism in the United States. Roughly 70% of all the men who do time in prison and who are released into the community are going to go back. Roughly one half of all the people, one half of the 2.3 million folks who are doing time in state or federal prisons are folk who did not go there because of a crime that they committed for the first time. Roughly half of them are there because they are parole violators. Or they're folk who've gone back because they continued the cycle of crime that uh, got them involved in the system of incarceration in the first place. So you have this cyclic pattern. Folk being arrested, being tried, going to prison, staying in prison for two, three, four years, and then coming back to the community. After three years, the cycle begins again. A very important paper published in the American Journal of Public Health in 2003 indicated, using data from 1996-97, that in 1997 alone, roughly one out of every four persons in the United States living with HIV AIDS did time in a jail or prison. So our prisons become less a site where people are being corrected less a site where people are being rehabilitated for whatever crimes they may have committed. It becomes, for all intents and purposes, an engine that is driving social inequalities in the communities that prisoners are from, but it's also considerably contributing to the decline in the health status of the, of the communities to which they'll return. So what happens when people come back? If you have read the book by Michelle Alexander, The New Jim Crow, you know that the, that the real issue isn't just that men, and in increasing numbers, women, are being locked up. It's that if you have been convicted of a felony in the United States, it is the scarlet F that remains on your forehead. It is a mark that does not leave. In what way? Well, number one, convicted felon, in most states, the vast majority of the states, You've lost your rights as a citizen. You can't vote. There are seven states in the United States where one out of every four black men has permanently lost the right to vote because he is carrying a felony conviction in his jacket. What does it mean in a 
point in the evolution of our democratic society that we have created a system that routinely disenfranchises significant numbers of adults in the community. And what does it mean when there are communities where such a significant number of the men cannot vote, cannot be a part of the political process that makes decisions about what's going to happen in the community now and in the future? And let's understand, it doesn't just end with having lost the right to vote. Many of you ever had a chance to visit New York City? Yes. I remember. <laughs> I want to take that as a, uh-huh. <laughs> you have a felony conviction that's related to drugs. And you've done time in one of the prisons in the state of New York. When you come back to perhaps enter public housing, or to go with your girlfriend or your wife and your kids into Section 8 housing, one of the first things you'll discover is that, oh no, oh no, you cannot enter. Not only can you not enter, if your family welcomes you back into public housing, welcomes you back into that Section 8 apartment, they all are at risk for being evicted. Yep. Some of you have probably read enough history to recall that in 1968 there was a huge polemic in government circles about the black family and the fact that so many black families were female-headed households that were living in poverty. And everybody was asking the question, where are the black men? Where are they going? What's the future of the black family? Well, you're a mom living in uh, the projects in New York City. Your man has just come back from a five-year bid upstate. You know that if he comes into the house, you and the kids could be tossed out on the street. Do you let him back in? No. <laughs> One woman said, no. <laughs> Absolutely. A whole bunch of folks should come <laughs> well, let me tell you how this works out. 50% of the men who are homeless in New York City cook with a felony conviction. Rates of HIV AIDS in that homeless population exceed 60%. And did you know that if the cops pick you up in New York City in a sweep and they ask for your ID and you cannot give them a permanent address and they run your numbers and discover that uh, you're on parole and you don't have a household to return to, being homeless means that you violated your parole and you're going back to the joint. You get the picture? Yes. How many of you have gone for a job and uh, had to fill out the requisite application? What's question number five, always? Yeah, see, we all did that. We can have church, right? <laughs> have you ever? Okay, this is uh, 2013. You're not stupid. You're not going to say, yeah, I did a bid for uh, breaking and entering, and I did another one for possession. No, 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 no. No, 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 no not me. Well, the issue is you also want to get paid, right? Which means that you're going to give them your social security number. As the sister just said, and that's it. How many times have you gone to Google and seen that little box in the corner? Has he been to prison? Look up his records. There is no way in our information-driven society, if I have your social security number, I can't find out whether or not you've been arrested, convicted, what happened. So the guy comes out from the human resources office and said, excuse me, you lied on this application. You have a record. No job for you. So the next time you go, when it comes to question five, you are the pinnacle of truth. Yeah, yeah, I did a little bit here and I did a little bit there. And are you going to get the job? Nope, no. In this economy? Oh, no. Oh, no. I don't think so. But the real damage that gets done to many com communities is the one that is perpetuated by the U.S. Census. You know, the census counts you not where you are from or where you are. In the state of New York, there are seven neighborhoods in New York City that in the 1990s, at the height of the HIV epidemic, provided 75% of all the men doing time in prison in that state. Those seven neighborhoods were the ones that had the highest background HIV serum prevalence rates. These are poor communities. Mont Haven in the Bronx, for example, according to the last year's data, had a rate of HIV infection of 3% per 
Not 26 per 100,000, which is the national average. 3%, that's 3 per 100. Those are rates that rival many nations in sub saharan Africa. But understand that federal dollars for education, for employment, for a whole host of things that ought to come to Mount Haven don't go because Mount Haven has to unfortunately deal with the fact that it has a lot of what are called million dollar blocks. Well, what's a million dollar block? I'm going to go count for me. A million dollar block is a block where if you were to count the number of men whose permanent address is that block and determine that they were doing time in prison, you multiply that number times $30,000 per year. The amount that it costs to keep a male incarcerated in the state of New York and the total would be in excess of $1 million. Well, understand that the census doesn't count these folk as being from Mount Haven. Whatever federal relief comes as a result of your census numbers, it's not going to go to that community. Where it will go is to Fishkill, Elmira, Sullivan County, New York. These are the places where these men are housed and doing time in prison. So that New York State is one of these interesting political maps. Its power ought to be in New York City, but in point of fact, with so many of New York City's residents doing time in rural communities in upstate New York, there is a sort of an interesting split between Republicans and Democrats. There's an interesting infusion of federal dollars into these tiny communities that are getting the dollars not because of the folk who are living in the open area. They're getting these dollars because the men who are doing time in these joints who can vote, who have no voice in how that money is going to be spent in those communities, but whose presence has everything to do with the political crowd that those communities enjoy. We're going to talk about social inequities and its impact on health. How about the notion that health dollars that could be going to their home communities are being diverted elsewhere? So what else happens as a result? Forget about just what occurs as a result of so many folk living with a felony conviction and the consequences that ensue. I'm trying to suggest that when you take large numbers of men out of a community, the most important responsibility that all communities have, which is bringing young children into their adult roles, that's going to suffer. This isn't about uh, issues of sexual preference and what makes up a family, whether it has to be a male or a female, no. Adults need to be involved in the lives of children. Take 50% of the adults out of the community. And why should we be surprised that at the height of the crack cocaine epidemic in the 1980s, when these policies of incarceration were enraged, the most important sellers of crack cocaine were adolescents between the ages of 13 and 19. Why? Drug dealers aren't stupid. If you are busted for possession and you're an adult, you're going to go away for a while. If you are an adolescent or a juvenile, you'll be back home within a day. We continue to feed the drug machine by engaging adolescents in the sale of these drugs. And for those of you who do research that looks back at that era of the 1980s, when many young people over the age of 15 were heads of household because they were the ones who were making the money. They were the ones in a post-industrial economy who had a job. Why should we be surprised that what were typically family-oriented poor communities had become something else entirely? Incarceration affects children, but it also affects mating rituals and marriage. In communities, for example, where women exceed men by a ratio of two to one, one of the first things that's going to go out the window is the notion that I should be negotiating with you about whether or not in a sexual encounter, condoms are going to be used. Sandy Lane at the State of New York facility in Syracuse points out in her research that one of the first things that happens is in a community where having a man is one of the most important priorities for women, if the way to keep a man is to say, I'm willing to engage in unprotected sexual relationships, folks are going to do just that. And those of us who are all about HIV AIDS and who are trying to say, listen, uh, unprotected sex, sweetheart, you don't want to do that. Well, here, as I did in the 1990s in a drug treatment program in the South Bronx, well, darling, I, I, I like your thinking here, and I read all about this HIV AIDS thing, but let me get this straight. 
If I have unprotected sex and I get infected, I won't die for another 15 years, right? Let me be real clear. I need this man tonight. I need his money. I need his protection. I need the shelter he can provide. Forgive me, Don. It's a rational choice. The future doesn't exist. It is an abstraction. My needs are right now. Multiply that discourse in communities where the men are missing. And why are we surprised that HIV and heterosexual women has been on the increase? And this is not to stigmatize the men. This is not to create yet another group that can be the object of our scorn. What I'm trying to suggest is that while HIV AIDS does in fact come from individual decisions, am I going to use the condom or not? Am I going to use clean injection, injection equipment? I want to suggest that the individual choices we are made are constrained and constructed by the choices that are made available to us in the social settings where we're in. So a rational choice from an epidemiological point of view would be to say, just say no. But in other circumstances and in other consequences, that rational choice is not really possible. And to the degree that these choices are structured by, in many instances, social policies that we are in a position to change, if we're going to alter the nature of the HIV epidemic in the United States, the first place to begin <coughs> might be with thinking about the wisdom of having systems and policies of mass incarceration that we that wreaks so much havoc on these communities. Every Monday for the last four semesters, with the exception of uh, the summer break, I drive two hours to Sullivan County, New York, where I teach a course in public health to inmates at the Woodbourne State Correctional Facility. This is a very simple thing for me to do. These inmates are part of something called the Bard College Prison Initiative. Our college, for the last 13 years, has been admitting inmates who qualify for a college education into their regular program of education. In six, in six facilities, excuse me, in upstate New York, our college has folks like me teaching a variety of courses that will earn inmates a BA degree or an AA degree. I have been developing a program that will create a concentration, a major in public health. And what's the idea? Well, the congresswoman said it today. Some of my boys are going to get out in September, and I expect to put them in the community, saying to folk, whoa, the Affordable Care Act is here. Brothers, are you hiding? Are you trying to make sure that people don't know that you've been away for a couple of years? Is part of your hiding that you're no longer trying to take care of yourself and your health? Because not only can you not afford it? You don't want people to know where you've been and what you do. A new day is here. A new day is here. You can get the health that you need. Your family, wherever they might be, can get the health that they need. But you have to get engaged. You have to get involved. At the beginning of this talk, I said that part of what I want to offer is a very practical solution. 60% of the men and women doing time in prisons in the United States are folks who are there as much because of their lack of education as anything else. We want to do something to drastically change the equation in this post-industrial economy. Is it possible for anybody without any kind of skill, with any kind of education, to get employment? I think not. But with 600,000 people returning to our communities every year, having been released from prison, and with many states from New York to Illinois to California saying, our prisons are overcrowded, we've got to let go of the nonviolent offenders, the real challenge to public health comes in the form of men and women who are returning who need to be able to stay in the communities in which they reside. Giving them educational opportunities, one small step that can be taken that not only benefits those of us in medicine and public health, the impact on the community is immeasurable. Want to be about social justice? Be about the problems that have been created by our system of mass incarceration. That problem isn't going away, but with you, it can get better. Thank you.